everyone and welcome to our panel this afternoon. I am Louise Tutt, the Deputy Editor of Screen International. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're thrilled you can be here and um, we're thrilled to be joined by our two producers here today. Um, we were hoping that um, Elizabeth Carlson from Number Nine Films could join us, but unfortunately she's making a film in a field somewhere and so can't quite get the reception necessary. Um, so hopefully she'll watch this, the recorded version of this that will be available online afterwards too. Um, and so the two producers we're with today have both made their names as traditional independent film producers before moving more recently into the business of developing and making authored talent length work for television. The peak TV boom of the past few years has seen a breakdown in the old hierarchy between film and television. Authored small screen work by directors usually associated with film festivals has become increasingly common and creative talent are moving smoothly between feature length and long form episodic work. We're gonna to talk today about why our producers have made or are making the leap into the small screen. And in doing so, we'll hopefully give us some insights into to the, how to do that successfully. Let me start by introducing them. We have Ed Guiney from Element Pictures who is joining us today from Dublin. Um, he runs Element with Andrew Lowe and they have offices in Dublin, London and Belfast. The company works across Hyatt. The company works across production, distribution, and exhibition. And on the feature film side, Ed works regularly with filmmakers such as Lenny Abrahamson, with whom he's made the Oscar-winning Room. And he's also worked on the English language films of Yorgos Lanthimos, including multi award winning The Favourite, as well as The Lobster and the Killing of a Sacred Deer. Element has also got on its film slate for Lida Lloyd's herself, Sean Durkin's The Nest, and Joanna Hogg's The Souvenir Part Two. On the TV side, Element most recently produced the lockdown phenomenon, Normal People, for the BBC, and Hulu, directed by Abrahamson and Hetty MacDonald, and based on the novel by Irish writer Sally Rooney. Ed, and through Element, is now working on a TV adaptation of Rooney's first book, Conversations with Friends, again with the BBC and Hulu, as well as various other projects. Hello, Ed. We Hello. are also thrilled to be joined by Alan Reich, today. Alan runs DNA Films with Films and TV, sorry, with Andrew McDonnell. The company's feature credits run to the eclectic and include horror movies such as Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later, also 28 Weeks Later, musicals, Sunshine on Leaf, sci-fi, Alex Garland's Ex Machina, I should have checked how you pronounce that beforehand, sorry Alan, <laughs> as well as T2 Train Spotting, again directed by Boyle. Waiting in the Wings is a feature documentary on legendary football manager Alex Ferguson, directed by Ferguson's son, Jason Ferguson, with Passion Pictures. DNA also has an absolutely thriving TV arm and most recently made the sci-fi tech thriller, Devs, with the BBC and US cable channel FX, which was written and directed by Alex Garland. It also has coming up three-part adaptation of Black Narcissus, based on the novel by Rumor Godden, famously made into a feature by Powell and Pressburger, that'll be broadcast, uh, well, Alan can tell us when it's broadcast, hopefully later this year. Um, and later, I think, yes, later this year. Yeah, and um, thankfully this year is beginning to run out. It's the directorial debut of Danish cinematographer Charlotte Bruce Christiansen, with whom DNA first worked on Thomas Vinterberg's feature, Far From the Madding Crowd. Um, so thank you both, lovely to, to be talking with you today. Um, I'm going to ask you, start by asking each of you why you simply, why you made the move into television. Were you looking for a project to diversify your slate or quite frankly, go where the money is? Or did a piece of work suggest itself to you as working better or even at all as a piece of long form drama? I think, should we start with Alan? Because I think you've been making TV <laughs> longest. Or trying to, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, I think it's a bit of all of, those things in as much as I think any producer of anyone interested in drama and stories uh, uh, around 10 years ago or would, would have been would have been highly aware as you, you, you say peak TV it's been going on for quite a while now that the that storytelling seemed to be thriving in a very particular way in television it was probably something to do with the advent of cable in the US but that it, it felt like a place that was very, very rich with possibilities. Clearly there was also actual 
money around and th th it's a different sort of model isn't it in in tv there's there's they need things you've got to have things to broadcast in slots in the bbc across all the networks so, so there's an actual actual need for product and cinema's always been particularly british independent cinema it, it's not really that people spend their time on a friday unfortunately saying we which film shall I go and watch at the cinema this week? If there, if at nine o'clock on a Sunday night there's no um, no drama on BBC One, then you might find people if if you still could do those kind of things, walking and you know protesting and down the street. It's a just a it's just radically different. So you've got this. Sorry, I don't know what you big. I'm trying to quit other. Let me just quit out. Oh, there you go. So 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 there was a desire. So so much. And I think it wasn't that we had one piece of TV, that one piece that, that, that was specific to Andrew McDonald and I, who, who run DNA together, just started to have an ambition, frankly, to make television. We were very well, uh, executive, if you like, in in America called Peter Rice, who is not so well known in the UK, but is probably the most powerful British executive in, in Hollywood. And he ran, he ran Searchlight Pictures when we were making independent movies for Searchlight. And he got, in Fox terms as it was, promoted out of Searchlight into running the sort of TV networks. And he started to say to us, we should be thinking of television and et cetera, et cetera. So we had, a, we had someone who was, who was, if you like, was actively uh, suggesting that we made TV. So all of those things kind of came together in, in, a, in a desire to try and work in, in, in this longer format that seemed to be so kind of uh, rich and fecund with different voices and different ways of doing stuff. And I think the, the other thing would be that it, when we, when maybe we all started in independent films, there was things you literally couldn't do in television to do, I guess, with sex and violence and language and all sorts of other things. So there was a, that if you wanted to make more extreme uh, 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 or tell more extreme stories on film, you had to make television. I remember when we made Shallow Grave way back that when we first showed it to various people at Channel 4, they were going, they sort of said, oh, I'm not sure this is broadcastable. So that, which seems very tame now, uh, but that those boundaries also of taste, if you like, uh, particularly in cable and, and, and various other places had also started to disappear. So essentially you could also tell exactly the story you wanted to tell in that medium as well. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, Ed, can you tell us a bit, I'm not sure, excuse my ignorance, I don't think I'm right in thinking that Normal People is the first TV series that Element has been involved with, or is it? No, in fact, like we've been making TV for quite a long time. Um, and in the 90s here in Ireland, we made television series for RTE. Uh, um, we made a show called Bachelor's Walk, uh, which was about kind of three young fogies, which was direct, written and directed by John Carney, who went on to write to do once so we so we were kind of but they were they were and actually it was for bbc3 back in those days but they were in a way kind of local shows for mm. irish television um and then kind of you know the crash happened in ireland sort of and just you know there was no money to do anything and in, in terms of television at least um and we kind of moved away from it um but i think like for us you know i guess we're yeah, a bit like alan like we're kind of film producers you know in our in our dna excuse the intentional pun um mm -hmm. but we but we but i think what alan says is completely right what television now allows is the ability to kind of um make the kinds of things that we may be have been making as films if that makes sense you know like we're not mm -hmm. um you know we're not kind of um uh, kind of mainstream film producers where I don't know whether you want to say art house or specialty or independent or whatever it is and in a way that opportunity didn't really exist on television on terrestrial television or sorry on television mm -hmm. full stop until very recently and but I think also for us it's you know we we have these kind of long-term relationships with filmmakers and 
it sort of seemed kind of mental that we wouldn't, you know, follow them into making long form television if that's what they wanted to do. So it was, so it's, you know, and we, again, I'm sure very much like uh, Alan and, and, and um, his, his gang, I mean, we read, you know, all the new books, you know, we spend a lot of time kind of scouting new opportunities, whether it's filmmakers or books or whatever it is. And again, would seem mad that you wouldn't be sort of thinking about what you might do across both film and television, you know. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a response to an opportunity that's out there. And I won't lie, I think, um, you know, there is a kind of financial stability around TV that doesn't uh, exist in film. And an awful lot of time in film, as, as, as everyone knows, you end up kind of not being properly paid or kind of having to defer or whatever it is. And that, that just isn't a really so much a thing in television. If you make a series, you get paid and you get pretty well paid. Um, and that is attractive for sure. Um, so we've kind of just tried to keep it as a kind of mixed thing, you know, that we, we do both. Um, and we offer, hopefully, you know, ho hopefully we can kind of offer, offer opportunities to the filmmakers we work with across both, if you like. Thank you. I think it would be really helpful for people watching and listening into us now, if we could talk a little bit about how you set up the financing for a TV program, because obviously financing TV is very different to financing films. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what producers need to know about that? You know, what do you do differently as a producer of a TV series than you do for a producer of an independent film? And how did, how did you learn about that? You know, who did you turn to for advice in the beginning? Perhaps, perhaps Alon? It's an, it's an interesting one. I think, I think just like in independent film DNA as a film company, we, we tended to take the position or decision, rightly or wrongly, and there's many uh, downsides as a film company that we would try wherever possible in work with studios, work, do, do stuff with Fox, with the speciality branches of the big studios and be fully financed and take the rough with the smooth in that world. When you then make an independent, really truly independent film, obviously it's much more patchwork um, and you try and get one source stable magnet, if you like, source of funding, and then add everything around it that you can with selling territories or getting investment in order to make your budgets. I think it's become very, very similar in telly. So we're lucky in devs in as much as we had a deal with FX, which were, you know, part of what was Fox. And as, it, as we made the show, we, we, we were commissioned by 20th Century Fox, we delivered to Walt Disney because of the merger that happened in the middle. Yeah. But essentially they were one stop shop. They funded the, the, the whole thing. They never, um, they, they have various deals. So they have an output deal with the BBC, which is why it got very, very well then sort of scheduled. And, you know, the BBC too loved it. And that was great. But essentially they didn't, need that and they would have they they I think again their model that, that the, one of the problems with this question is it keeps shifting so yeah. FX's model I suspect when we started would have been well to set to fully fund it they had their few their, their output deals including the BBC and then they would have tried to sell everything else in order to get the budget and maybe make a profit or wherever it might be now as we started making it in the shift to Disney and in the shift in the world, it became clear that what Disney specifically want is to hold on to all of the rights to all of their programs and stream them. Hence, we ended up being on Hulu and being the first show of, of a, a new brand called FX on Hulu. So Ed will talk to you about Hulu Hulu, who produced his, I think, directly with the BBC, but ours ended up on Hulu because Hulu was then bought by Disney when they didn't manage to buy Sky, et cetera. But of course, it's all about, they want everything and they that everyone's trying to be Netflix. And of course, Disney Plus has been one of the big, well, well no one's been going to the cinemas or the theme parks or the cruises, Disney Plus has been, been a success story. It's not a very dark um, that I think one of the things is that, that the models change, um, but I think it's I think it's more similar than dissimilar to film funding as we understand it. And if so, if you have a FX, they will they are essentially the same as having Disney or Fox fund your film. It, it, the BBC 
they tend to give you an uh, you know they'll give you a tariff and you have to it's all about trying to then fit you know your budget they'll give you x and your budget is x plus y and you have to find y uh, but it was always like that and essentially if it's really big you have to go to america in the same way that we would always have had to do when we were trying to fund slightly more ambitious independent films mm. Um, Ed, you're nodding. So it sounds. It, so is that sound like your experience on normal people? Yeah, I mean, we. I guess we had sort of, like, in some ways, a kind of classic, you know, sort of British originated. Um, yeah, albeit Irish, but you know what I mean. Um, British kind of originated <laughs> television production experience in that we we developed it. I mean, we we actually had a slightly, I uh, maybe in a, in a way, kind of a sign of the times. I mean, it was developed um, and and produced with the BBC, but it, it, it had a kind of interesting um, genesis because um, we we had, uh, you know, could talk about this a bit more, but we were developing conversations with friends as a film with with BBC Films, with Rose Garnet and BBC Films. And that, that was Sally's first book. And then um, we, you know, Sally's second book, Normal People, this is about two and a half years ago now, spring 2018, that kind of was going out into the world. Um, and we didn't know whether it was film or television and we were going to get, you know, the galleys like everybody else. Um, and I remember at the time thinking, you know, I sort of hope I don't like this because there's no way mm -hmm. we're going to get like Sally's second book because she's not going to give two books to the same production company. Um, and uh, anyway, of course, I loved it. We absolutely all fell in love with it. Um, and Rose actually read it at the same time and, and kind of absolutely fell for it too. And we felt it was actually television, which was good, you know, because it sort of distinguished it in some way. And I guess because of the episodic nature of the storytelling in Normal People and the fact that it takes period, place over quite a, you know, four years, four years, in, very formative years in the lives of, of uh, uh, the protagonists. And um, it just felt like it kind of really lent itself to television. So we could kind of, I suppose, distinguish it from our approach to conversations of friends at that time. But BBC did a really kind of brave and bold thing, um, partly due to the kind of competitive environment that we all operate in now. Um, so I, I gave, I sorry, normal people to Lenny um, Abrahamson, who I had actually been in Trinity with, which is the university that's in mm -hmm. normal people. And although we're like an entirely different generation, we come from the same sort of world. So it's a kind of, you know, uh, you know, we first started making films together in Trinity. Um, so he, he absolutely jumped in it, loved it, could see the possibilities for it. Um, and, and kind of with Lenny's interest, um, the BBC made the very brave move of actually green lighting the show. Um, so that in a kind of competitive environment, we could go back to Sally and say, look, uh, given Lenny's interest, um, the BBC have said that they will make this show. It's green lit if we get the rights to it. And the reason they did that was because there was a kind of feeding frenzy brewing with the SFODs and all the big players internationally and all that kind of stuff because Conversations with Friends had been such a big success. So it was a really incredibly front-footed, powerful uh, thing for them to do. Um, and although it actually didn't effectively green light the show in, in as in the amount of money that they were, were putting in plus, you know, all the the other obvious things you can get like tax credit didn't actually hit our budget. It got us very, very, very close. So we knew that we'd find the, the deficit quite easily. Um, so, 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 so I suppose, you know, we then, I mean, in, in a way we were, we were kind of, we then took that interest and uh, knew that we were in a position where we were gonna make the show, which is brilliant. I mean, it's a really great way to kind of develop something and highly, highly unusual because most of the time what happens is you develop and then there are various hurdles you have to kind of get through as scripts come in and they're not as good as you hope and you know casting comes in and all that kind of stuff but actually we were living in a world where we knew we were going to make this thing um, and so everyone was sort of pulling together to try and make it in the best possible way rather than there being any question about whether it would be made or not um, and that just gives a lovely dynamic to the process it just means you're not sort of second guessing things you're just trying to do the very best thing um, and, and then at a certain point about kind of about, well, it was, a, it was uh, just before the Oscars in 2019, I remember because the favorite uh, had been nominated as you mentioned earlier, myself and Lenny went and met all of the, uh, the kind of American broadcasters uh, to see who might be interested in joining as our production partner. So we, we kind of spent two days being driven around um, by Endeavor meeting all of 
the different people and trying to sell our wares uh, with our kind of uh, like two uh, salesmen, which is what we were, uh, and Sally phoning in from Dublin, uh, depending on the hour of day it was, if you like. Uh, um, and, and that's how we came across Hulu. So that gave us the wherewithal to then make the show. Um, and then it then Endeavor kind of helped us sell it worldwide subsequently, if you like. So, so in a weird way, it's actually a bit like an independent film rather than mm. a studio film. What I mean mm. is mm. you kind of, you find your kind of keystone, whether that in UK terms is Film 4 or BBC Films or BFI or whatever it is, you get your sales entity and you then go out to the world and you sell off bits of it, whether it's, you know, in the first instance to an American distributor and then, you know, two other distributors around the world. And that's actually, it's a really good model because effectively as a, as a company, you own the project then. It's your project. You haven't sold it to a Netflix mm -hmm. or in, indeed anyone else. Um, but but it, it, it does speak to what Alan is saying is that actually, I think having come from film and been very used to doing that, I think we sort of, we weren't at all worried about sort of diving into that process, if you like, you know, we were quite happy to dive into that and that made complete sense to us. And in fact, sometimes um, our experience, you know, on other television projects, we've been slightly mystified by the way that, that sales entities work in television. They tend to be kind of, you know, to keep the producer one removed from the end user in a sense, they tend to do an awful lot of the work. Whereas as, just as film producers, we're often very, you know, we're in the, we have a lot of close contact with distributors, you know, whereas in TV, the sales and the sales agency or distributor, the international distributor sits between you and the local broadcasters and distributors. So you don't have that much contact with them. It's quite a, quite a weird one. So we were quite happy to live in a world where we were you know, kind of, we had this thing that was then being sold market by market, and we could have some contact and insights into what was going on. Um, but it's, listen, it's all up for grabs at the moment, and that's an exciting thing. You know, it's a really exciting thing. I think in terms of, you know, going back to your original question about development and how you find, how you set things up, um, I guess the classic thing is to, you know, go to, in the UK at least, is to go to, you know, one of the public service broadcasters, I include ITV and that, or and now indeed Sky or whatever, they develop the project with you, they input into it. And if it gets through, you know, all the various kind of phases and they want to make it, they will then put up a chunk of the budget and then you go and find the rest a little bit as I described um, with, with normal people. That's probably the kind of classic thing. Um, and I mean, I think one of the things certainly that was historically true about television, maybe less than that, but I think it is also true is, I think as a film producer, uh, uh, you can sort of, you can, there are sort of, in a way, endless sort of possibilities to get a film financed and they get crazier and more kind of um, irrational and unlikely the longer you go on. But you can actually get up every day with your film script and think you might find someone to finance it. With television, there are a finite number of end users and they really kind of control the, the kind of momentum. There are very few, very, like for instance, there are no low budget TV shows made like a six half hour TV show without a broadcaster, that never happens. Now, arguably it should and it could, but it doesn't, it really doesn't. Whereas as we know, there are lots of very low budget films made that actually sometimes find a home, but very often don't if you like. So there's a kind of, there's a bit more discipline in the world of television. Um, and also you're kind of making something for uh, a specific sort of format if you like. So, you know, you deliver a specific kind of duration. And also the other really, sort of stark thing about television is that you are actually making it for an audience, you know, uh, and I know that, of course, films are made for an audience, but very often they never find an audience ever, ever, ever. But if you make a piece of television, it's going to encounter an audience. And I think there's a kind of dynamic in that, uh, in that sort of inherent relationship that, you know, will exist, that also kind of changes how you think about something, I think, as well. Does it pay, do you think, to have a special sort of development executive who is versed in TV? If you're an ind independent production company, film production company, does it, you know, the process must be slightly different. Do you need somebody who knows about TV? It's a really good uh, question. Sorry, you go, Alan. Go on, you go, Ed. No, you go. Let's, no, no, let's... I was, I, because actually one of the things that I sort of, I, I felt that the making of television and the making of film were much more different than I actually think they are uh, now, if, I, if that makes sense. And when we kind of sort of 
were interested in getting back into into television in a kind of more serious way a few years ago, I kind of I, I suppose I felt like a little bit like, well, we don't we don't really know much about how to make television, and we don't have kind of hardcore script TV script editors who've done loads and loads and loads of stuff, and and and, I, and those people are brilliant and incredibly useful. But actually, what I've come to think now is that actually the similarities between making film and television are much, much, much greater than the differences. And I used to feel quite insecure about the, what I perceived to be the differences. And I don't think they're as important as one might think. And I also think coming from film, we bring different kind of instincts, um, which I think can be also very useful and very useful in the world of television that exists now, where actually it's all about embracing difference and kind of finding your niche and making something that has never been seen before. Whereas I think in a way, old school traditional television was really about in a way making different versions of the same thing again and again and again, detective show of the week or, you know, hospital drama of the week or romantic drama of the week or whatever it was, you know, there were kind of riffs on the thing. And that obviously still goes on now, but I think for companies like ourselves and DNA, well, we've always tried to do things, you know, sometimes, you know, in our case, these failing hugely uh, by making things that, you know, are quite different and therefore, as it turns out, quite not seen by people and possibly for very good reason. Um, but 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 that that kind of idea of trying to find things that are different um, and find voices that are different is now something that really is 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 an advantage, I think, in TV in a way that maybe it wasn't 10 years ago. I think. Okay. I think that. I mean, I, th I think that's. I mean, obviously, Ed and I come from very specific points of view to tell you. Clearly, to the sort of script editing world in in returning multi-format dramas, police or whatever they are, and they come back season after season. You just they need to be managed in a slightly different way. I would also say, obviously, what you really want in development executives as well, but which is very easy to learn is is the who the people are in telly might be different and as Ed said there there's a finite number I you I you need to know mm. if that if, if you've got something that the five broad, none of the five broadcasters are interested or they're all got a similar uh, show that they're about to make then someone in your company needs to know that otherwise you might waste a lot of time and money but I absolutely agree that the, that the skill of it which is about sort of translating stories is essentially the same or <laughs> Although our experience really is have we've done two TV shows, both of which have been, if you like, like long films because they've been one single story across three episodes or eight episodes. So I don't quite, ha you know, in some ways I'd love to test. I'd love to be able to come back in a couple of years with a long running show and answer your question again. Uh, um, but at that point, this point, don't have it. But I do think that it, that's the key, isn't it, isn't it, is that people, we, we, one of our development, our head of development actually wanted to be, on Black Narcissus, wanted to be the script editor as well, so that she, it was just another string, if you like, to, to, to go through the whole process, the technical process, the changes on the scripts, all of that stuff that was more televisual, if, if you like, even mm -hmm. though it was still one writer, one director, um, so she had some experience of seeing the the, 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 that side of it through the production process. Mm. Let's move on to talking about um, your directors because you both have um, these wonderful long running relationships with talent, Ed, you with Lenny and, and others and um, Alan specifically with Alex. With Alex, about here, yeah. Alex Garland. Um, how, it's, it's a slog making a TV series, isn't it? <laughs> rather than a film, you know, you're talking mm -hmm. about making eight hours rather than two hours, you know, how do you, how do you look after your director through that process? I mean, we found so 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 there was a lot of so Alex had always written this as eight there's eight parts eight hours or so actually eight four. eight FX hours so it's just maybe six and a half hours something like that a drama in the end and there was there was not exactly pressure but there was there was a big conversation at the beginning of whether he should or shouldn't be directing all of it and that didn't it was a conversation that actually didn't last very long but it was you know there was a lot of good reasons but actually he what he really wanted to direct all of it and I think one of the so it was so it's a hundred days 
I mean, 100 days, I guess if you're making huge movies, that's, made, mm. I don't know how, how many days a Sam Mendes directed Skyfall. I, I, I don't know. Um, but it was, it was, it, and, and we were in, we were in London, we were in San Francisco, we were in Manchester, we were across the world. One of the things that we did, that we did was essentially building hiatuses, which happened naturally through change of country, through mm. Christmas, but also through, through to try and do a little bit of editing and also give Alex a little bit of time off. So we built in a couple of extra sort of weeks. They weren't really off, but they were time to be in the edit room, time to just recharge. And I think that was also very helpful. So it wasn't a hundred days, you know, straight. We worked, we, we also were very, you know, you work five day weeks and you worked, we worked 10, we, you know, we, we worked, um, in a, in a very focused way, I think what well, they used to call French hours or continuous hours, which is of course what everybody does now, but essentially we start at eight and finish at six and we would do that. And we were quite disciplined in, in doing that so that the, because not just for Alex, but there was one cameraman, one first AD, everybody, it was like a movie, mm. not in terms of, it was written very, very much as eight parts. If you've seen the show, it's very much a TV show in eight parts, but the production of it, was essentially the same as a film because it was all, it was, there wasn't a different crew of another director and cameraman who were overlapping in any way. So it was all continuous. So we had to build in certain points of rest and making sure and keeping an eye on it. I mean, I think, you know, if it, 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 he, and, and actually interestingly, he, I think having gone through it, one of the things Alex says is, well, look, I managed to do, I can do two films back to back now or whatever, I could do this because I've done essentially three films back to back in mm. one go. And so it made it, it, and the stamina by pacing it, uh, um, actually we all got through it in that respect. How, how long did post take then? Because I mean, he had to uh, cut everything and- He also cut everything. Obviously some of the posts had started, the editor had started, we'd got, a, we'd got um, um, episode one, that the studio had seen, but of course it had big gaps in it for bits we hadn't yet shot because we didn't shoot anything as episodically. We shot it all as as a, a movie. As a movie. Yeah. So we yeah, hadn't yeah, been yeah. in the queue. Essentially the big queue was the last thing we shot, which was in Manchester. So none of that was in episode one. Um, and it took, I, uh, 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 it took a, a while that, and that was wow. the bit that they were and it was one editor as well and that was the bit wow. that they that essentially fx had never done a show they were brilliant fx because that's not how you know television is supposed to be made and it meant they had to be slightly more patient and buy into it and what they decided was to buy into it uh, completely and they loved the scripts and they loved what they were seeing and they were incredibly helpful and and said okay well if this is how it's going to be let's have a schedule that is realistically looks at that one and we showed them we would then edit episodically so that they could see as much as possible we'd go through it and they'd see where we were and we'd move through it once and then we'd move through it again and get it finished uh, so so that there was a sort of there was a momentum for everybody so that it felt like oh episode one's nearly done and on we went Wow, gargantuan yeah, work. Though. It was a bit. It was. It was mad. Everyone was very, very tired at the end. <laughs> Is it going to be a second series? Alex never. I mean, FX. I don't know what they'd say now, but uh, they always the, the, the broadcasters, particularly American broad, broadcasters, always want more. You know, more series if they, if it, if they think something's working because it amateurizes the cost. It's essentially, it's about marketing. If they're going to spend so much money and 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 finesse, you know, they're brilliant marketeers getting this to the public that, that then why not get the then when they get to series two everyone lots of people will come back and watch series one and, and people stay with it but Alex was ne Alex only really wrote it as a single thing and 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 I think it would be very very hard to get someone else to take this that particular story it's so particular mm. um, and he, his obsessions further so so sadly I don't think so <laughs> Um, and Ed, on Normal People, Lenny directed with Hetty. Hetty McDonald did some as well, didn't she? Yeah. So, and, and 
I mean, what's the, um, you know, there's the old saw about TV being a writer's medium rather than a director's mm. medium. Yeah. I mean, do you think that's changing? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a really it's a really good question. Um, I mean, we you know with normal people we sort of had a kind of um, a, a kind of a brain trust who made it, if you like, which obviously included you know uh, Lenny and Hetty, but Sally was an exec producer on the show and she wrote the first six episodes with Alice Birch, and then um, my colleagues Emma Norton and uh, Chelsea Hoffman, uh, Andrew Lowe, we like we were all kind of very much, you know, sort of involved in making it. And um, I mean, you know, I'm sort of slightly um, gobsmacked by the notion of Alex doing six hours and, and also cutting it all. Uh, that seems like mad um, uh, because actually it is an enormous amount of work, you know, I mean, making a TV show and that, you know, I, I, I definitely felt it, particularly in the post on, on normal people. Um, and I'm sure Alan will probably agree where actually, episodes are coming at you so fast, you know, and different iterations of episodes are coming at you so fast. When you're in post-production on a movie, it's sort of, you know, you wait ages to see the first cut and then they come every maybe three or four weeks after that, you know, until you lock picture. But it's, there is a bit of breathing space. Whereas with television, you're getting, you know, the third iteration of the second episode along with the first iteration of the fourth episode. And, you know, and you have to react very quickly to it. Um, but to answer your question, is it a, you know, I think I think, you know, Lenny was at the very heart um, of of kind of uh, how we approach normal people, um, and I think um, we made it like a film. I think because we don't really, I guess, sort of don't really know how to make television, so we just approached it like we would a really long movie, if you like. And um, and I think from what I know of other television productions were probably less rigid about things like schedule and post-production schedule and how long it takes to edit something and all that kind of stuff. We, we, we take a more filmic approach to that, which is, well, you sort of have to get it right and you have to sometimes go back and do things again and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so um, I guess, you know, you're, you're coming at it from a kind of, um, certainly in terms of the production, probably from a filmmaking point of view. So with the director very much at the heart of it and certainly in our case, you know, Lenny would have, uh, amongst us, have had the kind of casting vote in terms of key decisions, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, everyone has a seat at the table and it's a kind of functional sort of brain trust, as I said earlier, if that makes sense. But but I think also what we had was an awful lot of trust. I mean, Sally and Lenny got on incredibly well, were huge admirers of each other's work and really respected what each other brought to the process, if you like. Um, and obviously Alice and Marco Rowe as well. Um, as as uh, writers of the other episodes, so it was it was it was highly functional, um, and uh, and it didn't feel like anyone was kind of you know necessarily jostling for a sort of uh, prime position. But truthfully, I think that the kind of creative arbiter or, or you know the person who had the kind of sort of final say or most you know had the uh, had the kind of most powerful voice in it was Lenny. You know, I mean he 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 did, uh, and I think that is probably a good thing by and large. It's not to say that you couldn't share that with a writer, I think you could, but in, in the case of normal people, I think that was probably the case. So we didn't have a formal showrunner. Uh, if there was one, maybe it was him, you know. And excuse my naivety here, who would have, who has final cut in these situations? Is that, you know, contractually? The, the bro broadcasters almost always have final cut in television. And again, Please jump in, Alan, if you think that's not the case. Um, and, and, and often they have it even on a kind of on their own service, if you like. So, you know, they can they can choose to have a version on their own service. What's really what we found incredibly helpful, or what you know, we generally find very helpful is that, um, you know, that, that, that kind of in, in protecting what's really important about a show, um, having kind of a home broadcaster as a key partner is a really important thing because as you go out into the world you know and you kind of form something in shape but they are you know very helpful in kind of articulating um, and protecting maybe what's very important about it as it encounters other broadcasters and other partners around the world although um, I have to say in our case with normal people Hulu were absolutely brilliant to work with and completely got the book and what we were doing from the very off, much more so than I expected them to, um, because for people who've seen it, there's quite a lot of Irish vernacular in it, 
quite, you know, quite often quite strong Irish accents, actually. Mm. And there was never a note about that. They just let that flow and they let that just exist. And, and actually, I expected an awful lot more. Um, but I do think, um, so, so the final cut thing, I, I, some, some um, filmmakers or creators do get final cut in television, but it's uh, less usual than I think it is in, in uh, film. Yeah, I don't, it, in some ways also it does, it, it sort of didn't come up to a certain degree with that, it, in the FX, we had a deal with FX, so did Alex, we just sort of put it through, we didn't have a big other contractual document that it was like, that had to argue these things. I suspect it is, essentially it was them, that they were, I mean, FX again were very much, it's your show, we'll obviously, if we have opinions, we'll tell you our opinion. John Landgraf, who runs FX, is a very sort of, uh, he's a sort of rather professorial. He's not. He's not your average. Uh, he doesn't come across at all as your average sort of Hollywood executive. And he loved getting into the weeds of determinism and and you know uh, uh, um, multiverse and all sorts of other things. Dual slit experiments with Alex and Gina again, who was our exec. Was with, they, they were exceptionally helpful and supportive. And, and smart so you know we, again as as Ed was saying it's like it's it's sort of best idea wins no no one's going to and, and Alex was so clearly the arbiter and obviously to do to want to bring him in and do that show that they had they were they they embraced the 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 kind of writer director of it all we probably had less be the only thing I would say because of our having one cutting room I probably had fewer Different episodes flying on me at different different times because there was only one editor, one yeah. director. Yeah. So to that degree, it lasted longer, but it maybe was uh, it was slightly calmer as we went through. Maybe I don't know. Mm. It swings and roundabouts. <laughs> I'm just going to take this moment to say that if anybody would like to ask a question of either Alan or Ed, that you can leave a question in the little Q and A box at the bottom. Um, We've got a few, we've got about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has anything they'd like to ask specifically. Um, but I would, I would like to ask um, what you are both doing next. I mean, Ed, you're working on conversations with friends. How, how far along is that now? Um, it is, we're hoping to shoot early new year, possibly late this year. Um, um, is, is, is Lenny directing that as well? Lenny is directing that also, uh, and we will be bringing on a, another director uh, as well. And uh, yeah, it's a really interesting one because it's sort of, um, you know, we were, we've been kind of sort of having, we have four writers on it, um, and, and uh, it's been a sort of a virtual writer's room, you know, for most of the summer, if you like. It's sort of... Um, uh, uh, so it's definitely born of of the lockdown in that sense, and still is the case. Although we did manage to have a meeting with six people for you know when there was a brief respite about a month ago, but now we're all back on on Zoom, if you like. Um, and we are yeah we're shooting it in Northern Ireland, and we're beginning to build set. We're building sets in a way that we didn't on normal people. Um, I mean, it's obviously different to normal people, but set in a similar world. It's it's kind of contemporary Dublin um, uh, and about two students who are uh, at Trinity. Um, so but, it's, but you're it's, shooting in Northern Ireland, did you say? Yeah, we're shooting it because it's a BBC Northern Ireland production. So, uh, or it's, yeah, so we're sh shooting in Northern Ireland um, and building a lot, partly to do with, um, you know, just the times we live in, partly to do with coronavirus. It's just, uh, it's more controllable to, to actually to build uh, sets rather than try and get into locations. Um, and yeah, and we're just deep in the casting process at the moment and it's with BBC and Hulu again. So that's sort of, you know, very kind of um, well-established relationships at this stage. Um, but it's, you know, it really, really, you know, and I, you know, Al may feel this too on things that he's doing. It's really, it's very challenging right now, you know, with all the stuff that's going on, it's extremely uh, mm -hmm. difficult. Um, you know, we, you know, Belfast is in a kind of, Northern Ireland's gone into a sort of a sort of semi lockdown for four weeks. And that's just makes life very difficult when it comes to kind of building, just getting around the city when it comes to, you know, even if you're formally allowed, even if there's a kind of exemption around film and television, which there seems to be generally, that's, that's the vibe. Um, it's still just hard, you know, hard getting supplies, hard, you know, you know, doing the things that we, you know, all take for granted. So it is, it is actually a real slog in a way that I hadn't expected it to be. But having said all of that, we are 
incredibly lucky that we um, are in an industry where we can sort of get back to work and, and uh, albeit with all the kind of protocols and protections and all that kind of stuff that, you know, you know, that, that you know, we have to, we have to account for, but, uh, you know, we can actually get back and make things and, and, and obviously lots of people are and, and so that's, that is a real blessing, um, you know, because we all have friends who, you know, live in other mm. parts of the arts that's and, um, you know, theatre and music and stuff like that. Comedy, I mean, it's just, you cannot work, it's impossible. And that is an absolute tragedy for people. Um, so when I'm feeling a bit down in the dumps, I just think that we're lucky that we can actually, you know, at least try and make things and and, and serve an audience. And, um, you know, we also run cinemas in Ireland and, We've had to close them down and, Oof, you know, all yeah. of that stuff. And yeah, we were about to release uh, Phila Deloitte's film herself with Picture House, which we had to postpone um, because obviously all the Picture House is closed down along with all the Irish cinemas. So it's, it's a really weird time, um, but, but television endures and people are watching it and, and people are making it. So that's mm. obviously a positive. And what are you working on now, Alan, at DNA? Well, we know it's so, it's so, I mean, we've been spending, we were, we at the beginning of the year, Andrew and I were like, oh, not sure we've, what, what we've got to shoot this year, what we've got to find something. And then within like oh, two weeks, it's like, thank God, we've got nothing that we need to actually shut down and stop. We, we spent most of this year, we've been editing the show you mentioned that was on around Christmas time on BBC One, which is a three part uh, adaptation of Black Narcissus. Well, in three parts, also one writer, one director, but obviously more obvious in within three parts. And that is, but that was really also very attenuated, given that it was all done remotely via pics, via all sorts of things that mm. the editor was, was self-isolating and shielded because she was living with her elderly mother. It was, and instead of being able to be in a room and go, something that would take 10 seconds, should we try this? Oh, that doesn't work, let's move on, was essentially, we try it, I do it, I put it on pics, we all see it, can we now all get back out? The, the sort of, every minor thing was, was took a lot of patience and it was, it was it's sort of exciting to actually get something done, but it also keep, kept me, it was, it was tricky, but it also kept me slightly sane in as much as there mm. was something real that every yeah. day needed progression. We've got a couple of questions um, from our audience watching. Um, Elizabeth Knight asks, is there a market for developing features with the SVODs or is it only episodic formats that they want right now? Um, I don't know if either one of you can jump in on that. I think the fact, I think certain, I mean, obviously uh, movies for Netflix have worked extremely well and they're not all, that some of them are, you know, original Netflix films that, you know, obviously one knows about the Scorsese's and all the rest of that, that where they put them briefly in the cinema, but they've had amazing success with their own, films and so that they they certainly are in the market and I think I think Hulu had over the summer they had a, a bit of a hit with an original Hulu film so I think they all look at them and certainly we've got one or two things that I think could be in that sort of world I think I think yes really is the answer mm. and Ed's nodding as well <laughs> um, and then Luca Louis asks What's the prospect for commissions of new TV series by new writers, given the current environment? It's hard enough in a normal environment. I mean, like, that's, I mean, that's interesting because as, as we've said, you've both, you know, your most recent TV series have been with known talents. Um, do you have any thoughts on how um, newer talents can break through in that way? Well, I'm really curious to see, and I, sort of think it should happen and I think it will happen is people making really low budget television drama uh, in the way that you know kind of self-financed maybe made with friends or whatever you know in the way that I don't know Clerks was made years ago whatever you know I think there's a real I think I, I mean it's probably happening on YouTube but I can really imagine a kind of breakthrough success I mean if you kind of can imagine I don't know you sort of whoever the new Shane Meadows is now with, you know, Paddy Considine and, you know, all those people, wherever they might live in the UK, just going out and messing with, you know, the new iPhone, which is supposed to be amazing and creating something, mm -hmm. you know, with, out of very, with very little resources needed, except, you know, smarts and intelligence and acting ability and, and a bit of vision. So I, I, I think that will start to happen. And I, you know, I think, you know, uh, 
it, it, you know, that technology is so immediate and so available to us now, you know, that, that, you know, if people can find the time and, and have the wherewithal to, to find the time to make things, it just feels like thing to do and expose them and try and get attention. And because people like Alan and I are like desperate to come across, you know, the striking new thing that just we haven't seen before, just feels fresh and new and vital and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think the truth is going through the kind of traditional broadcasters and all that stuff is, is, is quite hard. But as, um, you know, the, the, the world evolves, I, you know, more and more opportunities come through. And YouTube is an amazing opportunity for people right now. I mean, it's a sort of absolutely incredible thing, really. Um, so I, th I think, um, I think that, yeah, I think there's, yeah, I think just trying to find ways of making things and just getting them out there is, uh, even if they're 10 minute episodes, five, 10 minute episodes of something and try and find a way of putting it up. If it's good, it'll get attention and, and that will help push things forward. And as a writer, presumably, the best idea is to team up with a producer. You need a producer to go out to bat for mm -hmm. you. I mean, with um, do you two read unsolicited work or do you, I'm sure that you prefer it to come through an agent, but. I mean, we, we, we don't really, I mean, I would just say what, what, that what, what Ed said is that YouTube is, is, I think if you look at the numbers, the, the, it's an incredible, it's right up there, you know, just under Netflix and Amazon Prime in terms of the people who, who stream via YouTube. And obviously YouTube is, is accessible. And then you have shows like, I mean, it's a while ago now, about high maintenance, which was made on Vimeo and then was, and then was picked up I think by HBO, which was a really cool little idea that was uh, uh, um, that people saw. Because what happens is is that they percolate and via someone in the office or your kids or somebody, someone shows you, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, and I think also the, the, the you know with the 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 BBC, the, the, the thing that the traditional broadcasters also have to do have to do is be more diverse in in their outputs and who they work with so that is not that's non-negotiable now so and of course by definition because you look at the numbers up to now these people have to be really new voices because they weren't getting a platform and i think that like the michaela cole show etc being so massively successful and so brilliant is going to make them understand that oh actually here's what happens when you open access a little bit more and they they it's not i think it beyond now the sort of commitment that we've always heard it's it's an actuality so i don't think bbc3 etc that, that that there's just a desire i think youtube do it put it vimeo bbc3 and the writing the sending in scripts is i i, I again like ed i think you're, you're better off trying to do something mm -hmm. um we don't I don't know what Ed does we don't we don't read unsolicited scripts but of, of course you can it's very simple to pretend you're an agent I mean make an make or not pretend you could be a producer and go put some produce you know anyone's a producer with a letterhead and a, and a and a script so you can get past those things but you need to do stuff I think there's so many opportunities to do that mm. um I'm gonna and now I think, unless there, I, I'm going to ask you for for both of you what the last, or not 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 the last, or what's a good TV gem you've watched recently that you would that you recommend. <laughs> well, I said I may destroy it's a bit. It's a while ago now, which I do think was was mm. actual ge actual genius. Yeah, it was incredible. Um, what else have I watched? Well. I, I thought there's been there's such a lot of stuff, you know. I, I I thought Des was great. Someone said to me, so, 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 some fr some friend of my mum's or so, someone said, oh, tell it on congratulations on the amazing TV show Des, and I'm like, I don't know, that'd be the <laughs> ten million people who watch Des. Mine is got a V, <laughs> only one only one letter out didn't have didn't have Doctor Who in it. Uh, but I did think that was terrific as well. Something I've mm. seen recently. Mm. Uh... I, I sort of started rewatching The Simpsons because we got Disney Plus during the summer and I'm really enjoying that. And uh, and more recently, I've been really enjoying Tehran, which is on Apple, which is the new series from the people who made Fada, which is also another great uh, Israeli kind of spy thing. Um, really good. 
Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Ed and Alan. It's been absolutely fantastic talking with you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your warm advice and insights. And very much looking forward to your next projects and hearing all about them. And thank you very much for everyone for listening and coming here today. And um, you'll be able to watch a recorded version of this later on, I believe, um, and all the details of that will be on the LFF website. But for now, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.